Welcome to Regional Eats Season 6 Marathon. Join us as we discover traditional food around the world and learn about how local producers are keeping it alive. Thank you for watching. We're in Kalamata in the Peloponnese, Greece. This region produces what is considered to be the finest olive oil in the world. It's made from this olive right here, the Koroneki. It is a very small olive, but also very rich and aromatic. Thanks to a cold extraction and the slow fermentation process, Koroneki olive oil tastes like no other, a true nectar of the gods. This is the land of ancient myths and heroes after all. This olive oil is considered a very bitter, very spicy olive oil, very intense, grassy, fruity, and that is what makes Koroneki very special. Like the aromas of that and the spiciness, the intense character it has. This region has a mild Mediterranean climate with extended periods of sunshine, which makes it the ideal home for olive groves. Koroneki olives are harvested from late October until late January. The best olive oil is considered to be the one extracted from the olives harvested in the first three weeks, when they're bright green. Early harvest olive oil is more nutritious. It is rich in polyphenols and antioxidants, which make the flavor fresher and more intense. As the olives ripen, they do not really get any bigger, but they will get darker. These ripe olives contain more oil than the green ones and will give a larger yield, but their oil has a milder flavor. To preserve the nutrients inside the Koroneki olive, the harvest happens as fast as possible. There are two methods. One is to shake the olives out of the tree with these electric sticks. Now they just brush the olives, the olive fall, and they do not hurt the tree. And it's only the olives that are ready to fall that actually come, come down. They no? do everything. So basically they go through the tree. Some of them are more ripe, some of them are more green. We need them both. We need them both to be harvested, all of them. Oh, uh, this one, yeah. yeah. Whoa, and so I, oh, okay. Need to do this job with goggles or something. Oh, that, it's, uh, let's see. Another method is to prune all the inside branches and then collect the olives with the help of this machine, which filters out the leaves. So the olives fill inside. There's the olives side. falling out. Be careful, be careful. It's raining olives. Yeah, it's raining olives. <laughs> With both methods, the olives fall into a net, which is made of breathable material to avoid compressing the olives. The net is then closed and the more stubborn branches and leaves are taken out by hand. Like fast, fast. <laughs> it's like brushing them. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so how many olives do you put in one sack? 50 kilos of olives in one sack. Wow. And from that you get uh, 10 kilos of olive oil. Okay, scratch the olive, squeeze it to find the olive oil inside. Oh. Now look, this is the olive oil. Oh, look. It's actually whiter, yeah, yeah, of course, because it's mixed with some pulp, yeah. And smell it. Fresh. Nice. This is the fresh grass that we're looking for in the fresh mm. olive oil. Exactly that sensation, that you just have crushed the olive and find the aroma. Oh, somewhere. yeah, there's so much juice inside yeah. the olive itself. Mm. Can we taste it? <laughs> no, they're very bitter. They are. <laughs> they are very bitter. But it's still nice. The Koroneki olive has a sister, Kalamata. Both varieties are important for the life of the olive grove. This is really good for the pollination of the trees. Also, think of tradition. People produced what they needed for the house. So they needed both Kalamata olives and olive oil. Because of their bitterness, Kalamata olives are not turned into olive oil. They are instead used as stable olives and go through a debittering process. They are cured in brine, then vinegar, and then stored in jars with Koroneki olive oil. Okay, we have more than 2,000 olive trees. Uh, some of them are 1,000 years old. We are very connected with the olive trees. Every family has 200 trees, 300 trees. It is their olive oil for the family, even though they are not farmers. And it's also for them an extra income. Together with extracting the oil from her family's groves, Dimitra will usually work with local families to extract their own oil. Her mill is actually paid in olive oil by these families, as it keeps 8% of the production. More than a thousand sacks arrive every day during peak harvest at Dimitra's mill. The oil is extracted within 24 hours. After this machine blows the leaves out, the olives are washed. 
This is an important step to remove any soil that may be in the olives that will give the oil an earthy taste. There is also a scale here to weigh the olives and see what percentage of olive oil is extracted from them. We need to weigh the olives to see how many olives every family has brought. Usually for the Coronaki variety, when it's early harvest, it's about 14, 14%. When it's mid-season, it's about 20%. The olives, including the pits, are ground into a paste. The paste ferments and spins for a few minutes to bring out the aromas of the Coronaki olive. Then the temperature cools down really fast to be able to extract the oil. Cold extraction means that the olives, the olive oil is produced with olives less than 28 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise you would uh, you would cook basically the exactly yeah, you the burn the olive oil. oil. Yeah, yeah. Now we extract the olive oil, so basically we don't press the olives. Uh, press is open air, yeah. so now here we don't want any oxygen. Press is human touch. We don't want that. The extraction of the olive oil happens in this machine here in just 15 minutes. It works like a big centrifuge to separate the solids, like the paste, the pit and the flesh, from the liquid, which is our olive oil. The process is very fast. From their arrival, olives are turned into oil in less than 45 minutes. The liquid gold that comes out is extra virgin olive oil, the finest grade in the family of olive oils. Extra virgin means that the cold extraction has preserved all the antioxidants and polyphenols present in the Coronaki olive, like cheese made with raw milk. Olive oil is also measured by a parameter called free acidity. For extra virgin, the free acidity must be 0.8% or less, meaning that less than 0.8% of the fatty acids normally present in olive oil have been damaged, either in production or storage. Extra virgin olive oil is more nutritious, but also has a shorter shelf life compared to other grades. We have the liquids and now we have to separate the liquids. There is some water that's naturally inside the olive oil. Again, it's a second centrifugation. At this time, it's vertical. Olive oil is light, goes on the surface. Water is heavy, goes down. And like this, naturally, they are separated. Yeah. Olive oil is stored in 300 ton stainless steel tanks. When not full, the tanks are filled with nitrogen. In fact, light, oxygen and temperature are the worst enemies of olive oil. Unlike wine, there is no such thing as aging in the bottle. Olive oil is only bottled when needed. Demetrius Mill produces more than 600 tanks of olive oil every year. This is my office. <laughs> this, the traditional olive oil mill. It was in 1904 that the olive oil mill started working. And my husband now is the five, fifth generation owner of the olive oil. Oh, wow, so this is how it was originally. This is the family, so this is my father in law. In that photo, he's four. Is four the small, yeah. yeah, the small boy is four years old, now he's 74. Okay, you're very lucky because this is the early harvest olive oil, harvested 10 days ago. Mm. So this is as fresh as you can get it, okay? This is the Coronaki variety. This is from our own land, family, family estate. I want you to take your hand like this. Mm -hmm. Close it and cut it. And let's roll it a bit. Usually when we taste the olive oils, we taste them in 28 degrees. This is the perfect temperature because you have the aromas of the olive oil, mm -hmm. you feel them, okay? Uh, extra virgin olive oil has three characteristics. Number one is fruitiness. Fruitiness, you can only sense it with your nose. And fruitiness has a scale from zero to 10 by international standards. Let's put our nose in. Oh. <laughs> I could put this on my bedside table. <laughs> Fruity, fresh. Nice. The Coronaki variety has the fresh cut grass as a characteristic. Yeah, okay. smells exactly like that. This is a fruitiness it's around 6, 6.5. And then, what okay. are the other two characteristics? Bitter, you feel it here, right and left part of your tongue. And spicy, you feel it here when you swallow your olive oil. So it's that movement you do the the oxygen to, yeah to sort of make the olive oil yeah, yes, yes. brief. So this is when you want oxygen. Exactly. This is the only time where you need a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. You want a fresh and green mouth, not to be disturbing you, not feeling bad. Good quality bread, good quality olive oil can really make make me blessed, make me feel really good. So nice. Well, you are definitely blessed. No. <laughs> to be doing this. I love it. I love it. Messinia is an endless olive garden as far as you can see. People of this land were called ilotes. 
Ilotas means slaves. They were not really slaves, but they were not fighting. They were producing the food of the area. That's why Euripides has called this land as Kali Karpo. Kali, good. Karpo, seed, fruit. So this is the land of the good, good fruit. Seed. No, oh, good the seed. Fruits. Good fruits. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Feta cheese is made with a combination of sheep's milk and goat's milk, which gives it that creaminess and an extra kick compared to cow's milk cheeses. But depending on where you are in Greece, you will get a different taste in feta, from soft and buttery to hard and tangy. It's all down to the combination of the two milks and how much of them you use. We're here in the Peloponnese to find out what other secrets are behind the making of feta cheese. Γιατί μπορεί να έχεις μια φέτα που να είναι μόνο πρόβια και μπορεί να έχεις και μια φέτα που να έχει μέχρι 30% γύρινο μέσω πρόβιο. Απαγορεύεται το αγελαδινό, απαγορεύεται, έτσι. Okay. Εμείς δουλεύουμε περίπου με 90% πρόβιο και 10% γύρινο. Why do you use a combination of the two? Like, how does that change the taste? Έτσι που θέλουμε να είναι παράλληλα και βουτυράτη, αλλά ταυτόχρονα να είναι και ελαφρώς πικάντικη. Ο μέσα θα ήταν πολύ βουτυράτο, αλλά δεν θα είχαμε αυτή την πιπεράδα που δίνει το γύρινο. The milk that you see here in this vats has rested for a day at cool temperatures and has been pasteurized. It is now ready to be turned into cheese. Once each batch has cooled to 35 degrees Celsius, Yorio's dad, Athanasius, adds cultures to the milk to kickstart its fermentation. My father is from 1948, he is 73 years old. The first one was my father in 1950. Then my father grew up and grew up. After the cultures rest 20 minutes, Athanasius proceeds to add rennet. The rennet used also comes from two kinds of milk. This time it is a mix of cows and goats to add extra spice. Each batch rests for 55 minutes and it's then cut into curds. The curds are cut first vertically and then horizontally to achieve perfect cubes. Yeah, well, you just like to cut things in cube a lot. <laughs> After being cut, the curds are transferred into molds, which are in the shape of cubes, of course. While other cheeses go into molds and all their whey is pressed out, feta's molds have some holes in them to gently drain the whey but without losing it all. And we'll find out why soon. Here, each cube holds 8 kilos of curd and whey, but will eventually weigh just 6 kilos. After a two-hour break, each cube is cut into 1 kilo blocks and salted. Athanasius is putting salt beneath and over the blocks to evenly coat the cheese. It will rest for 24 hours. You may have noticed these plastic separators. They are used to keep gently draining whey out of the feta curd. This liquid whey mixed with the salt draining is in fact going to make feta's natural brine. Once the packaging is sealed, feta will release even more liquid, adding to that brine. So uh, how many kilos is this? 20. 20, okay. God, <laughs> great kettlebell. <laughs> Feta ages for 15 days at 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. The temperature and aging time contribute to the intensity of flavor. The longer it ages, the more acidity it gains. Εμείς κάνουμε μια πολύ καλή ορίμαση εδώ, ώστε να έχουμε πιο έντονη γεύση. Άμα δεν οριμάσει το τυρί, καταρχήν θα είναι άγευστο. Οπότε δεν θα είναι υπόξενο, θα είναι σαν χορτάρι. Το πρώτο πράγμα που βλέπουμε στο τυρί, αν είναι όριμο, είναι το χρώμα της άλμης, αν είναι πολύ κίτρινο ή όχι, και το χρώμα του τυριού. Μετά βλέπουμε, πιέζοντα το τυρί χαμηλά κάτω-κάτω, πόσο εύκολα ή δύσκολα πάει κάτω και πόσο εύκολα ή δύσκολα έρχεται επάνω. Αν είναι πιο όριμο, έρχεται πιο γρήγορα. Μετά βλέπουμε και αν τα κομμάτια μεταξύ τους αρχίζουν και αποκτούν χώρο που σημαίνει ότι αρχίζει από οριμάζει το τυρί και σφίγγει. Είναι και αυτό ένας τρόπος. Τέστη. Oh, yeah, of course. Nice texture. Και είναι και ζεστό so ακόμα. Crumbly, so... Είναι και ζεστό. So... Βουτυράτο. Mm. Ναι, είναι υπόξινο και απλά είναι και βουτυράτο ταυτόχρονα. Έτσι. Αλλά σε τρεις-τέσσερις μέρες θα είναι αυτή η γεύση, αλλά λίγο πιο σκληρό. Just... Feta used to be aged in barrels. I've read that the barrels used to add a little bit of spice and the rennet giving it that bitterness. 
Είναι πάρα πολύ μεγάλο μύθο ότι επηρεάζει τη γεύση, την επηρεάζει. Αλλά αυτό δεν σημαίνει ότι θα έχει καλύτερη γεύση. After the first 15 aging days at mild temperature, feta is then stored at a cold temperature for 45 days to reach its full taste and aroma. Thank you. Δεν έχουμε κράσει μόνο. You can taste the goat milk there. There is that hint of spiciness. It's like the one we had before, with that extra crumbliness as well in the texture. It's a nice balance of flavor. You get like that aftertaste, that kick with it. Από εκεί πέρα να είναι λίγο πιπεράτι, γιατί θέλουμε και λίγο το γύδινο μέσα. Οπότε έχουμε να έχει βουτυράδα, να είναι υπόξινη, να είναι πιπεράτι. Και από εκεί πέρα να είναι και σε σκληρότητα. Αρκιμέτρια στο σκληρότητα. Η, η γιαγιά μου την έκανε ε, αρκετά πιο σκληρή. Η ίδια γεύση, αλλά πολύ σκληρή. Ο πατέρα μου την έκανε, άλλαξε και την κάνει μέτρια στα σκληρά, οπότε είναι και λίγο πιο βουτυρά. Και αυτό ήταν και πια η επιτυχία. Το τρώω όλο τώρα εδώ πέρα, να ξέρει. <laughs> Γιατί είναι πολύ ωραίο έτσι κι αλλιώ. Red Leicester is a raw milk, nutty, sweet cheese with a citrus finish. But no doubt what makes it stand out is its bright orangey red color. The cheese is actually deliberately turned this vibrant hue with a natural coloring called annatto. It doesn't contribute to the flavor of the cheese, so why is it added? The story goes that Stilton and its blue veins were so popular that other cheeses, including Red Leicester, were having a hard time standing out. So cheesemakers thought, what can we do to make it more popular? Let's just turn it red. And it worked. Red Leicester is one of the most popular cheeses now in the UK. So what is annatto specifically? Is it, like, is it a colorant, but is it na it's natural, right? It's a natural colorant from a South American plant, and it's been used since the early 1800s. Oh. And farmers' wives would have used marigold flour <laughs> coloring before that, or carotene. Yeah. It's a very deep right. color, and it sticks to the fat protein, to the curd, to the fat protein matrix as it goes through the process. So as the whey goes out, it doesn't have much color, but the curd does. Does it stain? Yeah, it does, yeah. And I normally manage to spill it everywhere, so they call me a natto Dave. <laughs> oh, it's fresh. Okay, well, no need to do nail polish. You can just dip <laughs> your hands in it. Do you want to pour it in? There we are. You got it? Okay, should I, what do I just, do? Just pour, it doesn't, make a pattern, write your name. It's like a futuristic sort of painting or something like that. It's a monster. <laughs> yeah, it's like a tie-dye tie yeah. shirt. <laughs> right, I'm going to switch the paddles on and then it'll make a, okay. an even more mm. wonderful pattern then. Let's see. When the milk has curdled, Izzy and Craig here are in charge of cutting the curds until they reach the size of a pea. The curds still look a bit white, as the annatto hasn't fully stuck to them yet and is still swimming in the whey. One hour later, the whey is drained to reveal some very yellow curds. They are cut and cut and cut into blocks, with the color getting brighter and brighter each time. Oh my god, it's so yellow, it's like hurting my eyes a little bit. <laughs> you need sunglasses on. Right, because you're like so close to it and you know, you know when you stare at the sun for a bit too long. It needs to stand out. Yeah. The curds are then milled and salted. David uses this fork to evenly distribute the salt. That piece is a garden fork. Okay. And we had somebody put a stainless steel stale on it. Could you take a little lump? This one. Yeah, it's quite nice. <laughs> just tastes yeah. salty now, doesn't it? Salty. Yeah, just tastes salty. And squeaky. Salty and squeaky, yeah, I know. Our American friends will know about this. <laughs> Each cheese is then molded and pressed into what will be a 10 kilo wheel. When the cheese is two days old, it is cloth bound with lard, a traditional method that had been abandoned until very recently. A muslin cloth is dipped in a bain-marie of hot lard and then wrapped around the cheese. Lard does not add to the flavor of the cheese, but creates a seal around it, preventing it from drying out and preserving its moisture and citrus finish. It also protects the cheese from molds, which eat the lard instead of the cheese itself, keeping it humid. Mold survives on the lives on the lard uh, 
and that slowly eats the, the lard away and then that starts to, and, and then, then the cheese can dry as it matures. There's a lot, a lot of lard there. Just fold it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's not really, there's a bit of lard dripping, it's okay. Back down. Yeah, perfect. Grab one of the edges. Okay. And this edge. Yep. Okay. You'll be able to grab your hand underneath and flip it. Whoa, because this all this lard yeah. is very slippery. Okay. And then just Pop it down. Ooh. There we go. Perfect. Red Leicester ages in a humid room from 6 months up to 14 months. Here you can see the mould building up and starting to do what David wants it to do, eat away the lard and leave the cheese intact. In fact, despite its mouldy appearance, the cheese will have a nutty, sweet taste with a citrus finish. The lard stays on the cheese and is only removed when it is ready to be sold. Larding, as well as using raw milk to make Red Leicester, were two traditions that had been lost. Like other cheeses in the UK, Red Leicester suffered the rationing of World War II, and farms either stopped making it or abandoned traditional methods. It was David who brought this traditional recipe back after over 50 years. Those colours on there are amazing. It's quite a contrast with the orange. Yeah, you, couldn't, you cannot do this job if you don't like cheese. <laughs> yeah, I like that. It, yeah, it is a bit crumbly, but yeah. uh, it still holds its shape. Yeah. yeah but it's kind of meaty. We're looking for a meaty texture. Yeah. Mmm, ooh. Yeah, yeah, I really like, I really like this combination of textures, actually. Yeah. It has a nice, sharp flavour. Yeah, that's quite citrusy, that. So when you break a piece of Red Leicester, it should just snap. There's little white specks, which are basically tiny little pockets there. So like eyes in the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's what a cheesemaker told me once. <laughs> oh, he's in the cheese. Yeah. Suffolk black ham gets this black crust from its curing process, which is like no other, using molasses, brown sugar and a local black porter. Soaking the ham in this sweet marinade doesn't just turn it black, it helps balance the flavour and break away from those more salty flavours of hams that are dry cured only using salt. The whole process takes 10 weeks, in which the ham is first dry cured, then marinated and then smoked. But it's all worth it. And here, Suffolk, England, is where this has been happening for over 200 years. How much beer is this? Like, this is quite a huge barrel. This is 39.5 uh, litres of uh, black porter beer. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like a stout, it's like a Guinness. And this is the basis for our, our black hams. All right, and uh, is this a local beer, right? This is a local beer from uh, Navigate Brewery in Clare, which is an hour and 20 minutes from here. As Mark releases the pressure in the barrel, the porter drains out into a cooker. Here is where we will make enough marinade to soak 40 hams. So you maybe want to dip your finger in there and just try it. Can I go? Yeah. Ooh. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a good beer. <laughs> Can I have a glass? The whole point of the marinade is that the marinade gets into the gammons. It adds depth, adds flavour. During the period of marination, the muscles are softened by the beer. So if you sit in the bath for half an hour and you look at your fingers, they sort of dry out and wrinkle. Yeah. But this is in the bath for six weeks. The beer first cooks on its own for three hours at 95 degrees Celsius. Then Mark adds sugar and molasses to the marinade. Yeah, there's quite a lot of sugar. This looks like we're making cake. It smells just like, yeah. So why is this recipe like so sweet? It goes back a long way. I think it's all part of adding flavour to meat, when meat was very salty. Because when you think about it, there was no refrigeration back in the 1800s, 1900s, or very little. And you wanted to preserve your meat, and the way to preserve it was with salt. But also the salt, it's not particularly pleasant to eat a lot of salt. So this was 
a way of dispersing the salt. Oh, sticky. Pure grade molasses, much blacker than you. Ooh. As you can see, this is part of the ingredient for black ham. Dance. It also being sweet uh, adds uh, not overly sweetness to the ham. It's quite a, a strong flavor. It's giving me some Christmas vibes, sugar mixing. Look at that. It's a fountain. In total, each marinade contains almost 40 kilos of brown sugar and molasses. Once the marinade is ready, it is left to cool down for a day. In the meantime, Mark strings the gammons, which have already been cured with natural salt, black pepper and fennel seed. This is uh, the leg of a free-range pig. Mm -hmm. This is around 11 kilos in weight. Mm -hmm. So this is just the rear leg of the pig, nothing else. This is ham, not sham. Do you want to hold that? 11 kilos. OK, that's like a kettlebell. It's, it's quite heavy. Here you have 20 gammons on the bone. This has been in here for a week so far. It, it has lost a little bit in terms of size. Yep. As you can see, it is gaining color, taste, yeah. flavor straight away. I turn them twice a week. I don't go to the gym, I lift ham and bacon. Oh. But by turning them, you get rid of the white patches and you get an even distribution of flavor throughout the ham. Because as you can see, it's quite dense meat and where they sit on top of each other, they don't get that flavor. So this is like a very long marinating process, much longer than like other curing processes. There's a nice color already there, you see? Yeah, and the black starts to come out. <laughs> I am. Okay, I can't do it. <laughs> the whole room smells quite strong. It's like you're, a you're, you're tangy, you're, you're sweet. You're smelling the beer? Yeah. It's yeasty? Yeah, yeasty. The meat soaks in the marinade for six weeks. As the marinade penetrates the meat, the skin gets darker. But for all flavors to really come together, we need a final touch, smoking. At Emmet's, the hams are cold smoked, which means that the temperature of the smokehouse is no more than 48 degrees Celsius, hotter, and they will cook. This is our original smokehouse. We still have the original door, dates from around 1820s, 200 years oh. old. So how long does the meat stay in there for? Well, I hang it in there and I let it drip initially because obviously it's been in the marinade. Yeah. I then put on the floor in the well, the actual beach flour itself, mm -hmm. and it'll burn anything up to two days. The smoking is not part of the preservation, the smoking is part of the flavor. The smoke, like the cure, like the marinade, penetrates the muscle of the meat. This is not an injection of smoke, this is totally natural. So here again, we have ham, not sham. I really need to get this yeah, shirt. One, yeah. So this is uh, one of our black hams. It's beautiful, look at it. Mark also makes black off the bone ham and bacon. Secret treasure chest. So these have also been uh, smoked. Ah, smells good this one, eh? After the smoking, customers can choose to get a cooked or uncooked ham. The hams sold at the shop are boiled, but they can also be roasted in the oven. Oh, woo. it has the same smell of the other room. As you can see, they're smaller now. When they're off the bone, they lose here again about two to three kilos. And so they cook down to around 5.7, 5.8, six kilos. Yeah. So actually the black is only the skin, outside skin. Black is the skin. But as you can see, the moisture gets into the meat, the flavor gets into the meat, the color gets into the meat. Yeah. It also becomes slightly fibrous. And this is where there's immense flavor. There are people who don't like crust on toast or crust on bread, but that's where the flavor is. Black hams are a local favorite. Emmet even held a royal warrant for 36 years. It means that the royal family had black ham on their menu for over three decades. But unfortunately, my humble opinion is all you've got today. Mm, wow, nice. That's the flavor. Yeah. So good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very sweet and um, as Steve, you were saying, there's a good balance between sweet and salty. So you can see it becomes fibrous. It's delicious though. There's yeah. still a little bit of jelly. Is it the sugar, right? This, this is, is the, the marinade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a nice bit of jelly in the middle there where the bone was. But as you get more towards the back, you get more and more fat and even more flavor because of the, uh, the skin area here. Yeah. So I have tried jelly deals, but so this is jelly ham. ham. It's unique to Emmett's. As I said before, it's ham, not sham. I'll open the door. Okay, yeah, open the door for, it's very, yeah, it's very, the door for you. <laughs> How's that? You have to put it, the, uh, the pan is on, so you have to put it. How? 
<laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> no good start. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll turn, I'll turn the fan off and then it's... The queen of afternoon tea served with scones and strawberry jam, clotted cream is sometimes confused with butter for its thick, rich texture. While it contains some butter fat, a lot of it actually, clotted cream isn't churned as butter would be. Instead, its butter fat is separated slowly following a precise, lengthy process that here in Cornwall has been passed down over generations. We're in Ruin Minor, Cornwall, and today we're going to find out how clotted cream is made. I can't wait to taste it. Let's go see how it's made. Just by looking at it, it has the consistency of ice cream. It looks a bit like ice cream. It does. The texture yeah, it of does. butter. Yeah. And the taste of cream. Cream. Of like yeah, yeah. milk cream. Yes, yeah. So yeah. it's really like these three things together. And all come from milk. Very clever product, milk. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And how did that clever milk turn into such a product? Well, clotted cream starts with fresh milk that is pasteurized at 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. This temperature is ideal to preserve its creamy flavor without burning it. It is then cooled down to no more than 36 degrees to force the milk to separate into fat and liquid. The next step is to pour it into the separator which skims the cream from the milk. So how much uh, milk are you putting here in the separator? This, that'll be 35 liters of whole milk gone in. It's usually one liter of cream to 12 liters of milk. milk. Oh, all right, that's, yeah. that's really small. Yeah. But you still want to make something out of it. Yeah, it is the cream of the crop, if you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> the best part of it. It's not easy to get it right. Yeah, why is that? Well, it's, I think it's the temperature, you know, of the when you process the milk as well, to make sure you, you actually start separating it at the, at the right temperature, the right consistency of cream. My uncle um, used to sell his own cream and he taught me that if the cream will stick to your thumb, that's the right consistency. If it falls off, it's not it, going to be any good. It's not good because yeah. it means there's still a little bit of there's milk still, in That's there. right, yeah, oh, yeah. So you don't want any, any you'll be that. A, you'll be here working with me in a minute. Oh, this is your test. Oh, it looks like nail polish. That's good. The separation is done twice to get the richest cream possible. Once the separator is off, Claire takes it apart to explain to me how it works. Here you can see a series of discs. When the machine is on, they spin and push the skim milk through the holes, while the cream, which is heavier, flows to the bottom. As each particle of milk goes through, they spin at such a rate, each one of them. Oh, oh, they all really? the cream, yeah, there's loads. It all see they all are separated, coming off like that. We obviously take them all off every every time we use them. But there's a lot of fat as well that's kept in here. Oh. It's probably really good for your skin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like a moisturizer. The fresh cream is then poured into little pots. By skimming the milk twice, what we've got is double cream. To become clotted cream, it will need to be left to set for 12 hours in the fridge. During this time, the thickest part of the cream rises to the surface, creating clots which will make it clotted cream. Oh, I see, so, so that's cook, why it's called clotted cream. You cook the clots, yeah, they cook the clots and the, the cream underneath should be runny compared to the top, so you have that lovely crust. Oh, I see, so this is the way to go and it is a very lengthy process. It is, yeah. yes, definitely. It's, it's well worth waiting for. They look nice and bubbly. They do, yeah. After spending the night in the fridge, the pots are ready to be cooked. Claire tells me she's found the perfect temperature and baking time to be 85 degrees Celsius for one hour and 30 minutes. This allows her to give the cream a nice crust without overcooking it. Oh, and what you want is that lovely crust. Yeah, it has You see crust. it crack in there and then it's running. It's just about right to put on that lovely scone. Oh. Make sure you have the, the crust on top. This is a good consistency because you've got the, the underneath isn't too runny, it won't run off your scone. Yeah. Your teeth will sink right into it. Okay, it's my turn now. I'm not gonna get a spoon as big as yours. You <laughs> Keep the crust, make sure that. there oh. you go. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> that was... 
felt it. Yeah, you do feel it. <laughs> yeah. You definitely need a scone to go with it. Not, you need yeah, to you're take, not supposed it's, to eat you're it. You're not like really going to eat it on its own. <laughs> Unfortunately, Claire had to run to bottle the rest of the fresh milk of the day. So I sat down with Margaret, the owner of the farm, to enjoy clotted cream the most traditional way possible, in an afternoon tea, or cream tea, as it's called here in Cornwall. The clotted cream is paired with strawberry jam and scones that Margaret herself made with some leftover buttermilk. While spreading cream and jam on your scone may look like the most natural thing, the order in which you do it has long been the subject of one of the biggest culinary debates in the UK. Which way should I start? Because I know here <laughs> there are a lot of rules on how to approach this <laughs> and I could be persecuted if I put one thing before the other. <laughs> Have your scone and then in Cornwall you always put the, some jam on it first. Okay, so first the jam. And All right. The, yes. Why would you put the jam first? and the cream last? Well, it's what we've all, always done it here. But I think um, if you put the jam in and you put as much cream on as you like, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> it, is, it is nice. I have a nice big one. That's enough, huh? the whole thing? <laughs> uh, yes, at least that much. At yeah. least? Oh, gosh. That's yeah. Quite, that's quite a lot, huh? Very good, this cream. Nice. Mm. Oh, I can see why you put this for last. Because it's really what stays there in your mouth. Mm. You know, when you, when you have it and you just have it on the top of your lips. Very, very good. I like the scones as well. Homemade Scone. by you. Yeah, mm. I really like them. Nice and soft and crumbly in the core. Good. Everything together is so nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Jam and cream. Jam and cream. Yeah, because <laughs> the jam the first and the cream was last. It's not cream and jam. <laughs> when it comes to Greek yogurt, we may think that the authentic version is made of cow's milk and is strained of its own liquid to reach the perfect thick and creamy consistency. Well, none of this is actually true. Real Greek yogurt of the kind made not in factories but in villages like here in Floca near Olympia has never been strained and probably never will. Here yogurt is made with full fat sheep's milk. This rich milk together with a combination of time and temperatures is going to give us a yogurt that is already tart and creamy in its own pot without the need to be strained at all. It all starts with that fresh sheep's milk. Drink some it of smells this. strong, huh? Yes. Wow, well, yeah, there's a lot of fun there. It's thick. Yes. It has a little bit of tanginess. Like you said, it's not sweet. It's a bit yes, acid. Yes, yes, yes. Yogurt at Anthony's Dairy starts with one day old cold milk. His technician, Tanasis, heats it up to 90 degrees Celsius, waits one hour, and then transfers it into small pots. Although it looks simple, gauging your strength with this pump is actually very difficult. Just oh, it's warm, huh? Yeah, in here. Like that? Do it, press it, slowly. It's super complicated because it's very, very sensitive. And it's also super warm. It's not too complicated, yeah. but it has uh, small secrets. Yeah. <laughs> it has every job. Has For sure. Everything. What, what is the difference between making, putting yogurt in like a plastic one versus no, uh, no, this no. bowl? No, 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 it's not a, it's the same yogurt. Uh, it's, uh, it has to do with the look. With the tradition. <laughs> yes, it looks more tradition. If you look carefully, you will notice that Thanasis is not filling the pot to the brim. He is leaving a little room for what Antonis calls the powder. It's made of old, broken yogurt that is 20 or even 30 days old, mixed with some fresh milk. It's added to ferment the yogurt, a bit like sourdough. Thanasis uses an even smaller pump to add the powder. And yes, the smaller pump is even harder to use than the previous one. Thanasis has to put only 5 milligrams in every pot, so I won't even try using it this time. He adds the powder from the side of the pot to preserve the crust at the top. The way that uh, Thanasis uh, uses is the same way that my mother, my wife's mother, was making the yogurts 50 years ago. This is the authentic yogurt. So, yeah, actually, you can see it already formed a little bit of a film, even though it's been yes, here yeah, yeah, only yes, for, like, one. 10 uh, minutes. Now, we'll close the door 
and uh, we turn on the heat uh, from 45 to 50 degrees and we are going to let it uh, for three hours. When the doors are open three hours later, a crust is formed on the surface of the yogurt. That is the butterfat present in the milk, whereas the liquid whey now sits at the bottom. It's ready, as strong we want for the time. Every yogurt is different. Not all pots turn into yogurt. In this one here, the powder didn't work. As Antonis moves the pots out of the fridge, he has to be careful not to move them too much because the liquid whey from the bottom of the pot can surface and spoil the yogurt. The only one that can handle a bit of wiggling for the camera is this 17 kilo tub that Antonis will turn into tzatziki. Although at this step it is important that the butter fat at the top and the liquid whey at the bottom stay separate, that doesn't mean that the liquid whey needs to be strained and taken away. The whey is sour and the butter fat is sweet. As the yogurt keeps fermenting at room temperature in its pot, the two will slowly combine. We open the window, we open the door, and all this fresh air works like a natural air condition. Oh, all right, yeah. The temperature goes down naturally. Believe me, this is something that uh, not many people can uh, see. Okay. Yeah, well, because you normally have a yogurt from, yes. uh, from the fridge. You see it, as we move it, it's not moved very easy, it's strong. Too. Yeah. So, what does fresh, warm yogurt taste like? Hmm. It's almost like baby cream. No, it's, yeah. like it's not like a feeling on your mouth that mm -hmm. you're used to. Because it's warm cream. And, and we're warm not, cream. Yeah, we're not uh, used to eating warm mm -hmm. cream. You ah. see, you see the juices. So this is the way, the liquid way in the milk. And this is the one that normally is taken away, you know, when you make strained milk. A small 200 gram pot of Anthony's sheep's milk yogurt contains 6% fat and 6% protein, both of which sometimes rise as high as 8% depending on the weather and what the sheep forage. These percentages of fat and protein are double what cow's milk yogurt is made of, it can only be matched by straining out the whey in cow's milk to increase the volume of butter fat. Straining means you need more milk, so more fat to have the same volume of yogurt. Today's batch of milk gave Anthony's 280 pots of yogurt. After resting at room temperature for one hour, they will have a 15-day shelf life if stored in the fridge. We had the milk, you see? Oh! <laughs> this is a final product. When the yogurt is cold, the taste of the crust on top and the creamy part below it will be different. This is sweet. Mm. All the butter. And it's very tart yeah. as well. Like he has, it's not sweet like at all. And this is really... You understand the a, difference? Yeah, 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 for sure. And this is this kind of milk compared to cow's milk or yes, like yes, strained yes. yogurt. This eat, is much eat more the inside. tart. Mm. Wow, it has a completely different taste. Huh? Do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a little bit sweet, but um, not sugary. To add an extra layer of sweetness, Anthony's lets me try the yogurt topped with some grape jam made by his mother. We also tried spread on bread. Mm. You know nice. what the, the doctors say? It's a full dinner. Yeah, I'm gonna send some pictures to my doctor. Mm. Bread? <laughs> and the uh, yogurt. We take the milk, any kind of milk they will give us. That's why sometimes the yogurt is stronger, fatter, more proteins. This is what Mother Nature give to us. We have to work with this and we will make the product. With whatever you have, yeah. And we will see if it's strong or not. We're in the woods of Alba, Piedmont, Italy. You can find white truffles growing in this woods and this woods only. These trees, together with the right soil and weather conditions, can only be found in this region of Italy. Together, they create this, a surprisingly big truffle, as you can see, but also one with a divine fragrance. Today, we're gonna go hunt for more. To find these famous truffles, we must hunt them in the woods where they grow. 
and because truffles grow underground unlike mushrooms, I needed to go on the hunt with licensed truffle hunter Gianni and his two dogs, Penny and Vito. Qui comincia la zona tartufigena, la zona dove ci sono le piante che danno il tartufo. Toyu! Eh, lei è un, è un, un incrocio, non è un cane puro, è un bracco puenter incrociato col beagle perché sono razze più forti e potenti. Lui è un cane di pura razza, è cane per eccellenza da caccia che si usa qui in queste zone, è il, lo spinone italiano perché comunque c'è un feeling tra me e il cane. Eh, io oramai conosco il cane, già, già solo le movenze del cane, come si muove, come muove la coda, io riesco a individuare, a capire se cerca il tartufo o se nell'aria sente l'odore della selvaggina, dell'animale selvatico. Dogs are the only ones that are actually allowed to dig into this soil. Tools like hose and rakes are forbidden. If the soil is hard and the truffle is hidden deep down, a truffle hunter, or trifulao in the local dialect, is only allowed to use this small tool called zappino. We visited during a period of heavy drought, so truffles were mostly on the surface and there was no need to use it. Pina! Ah! Eccolo, che cos'è questo? Questo è un nero. È lo scorzone. Prendi la penny. Pina! Viela, c'è? Dov'è? Che c'è, che c'è? Sempre un nero. Profumato. After hunting for three hours, we only found black truffles. The heavy droughts this year made unfavorable conditions for white truffles to grow. È stata una grande annata per i vini e una brutta annata per i tartufo e per i funghi. Perché il vino, la pioggia, fa sì che l'uva marcisca, gli acini marciscano e escano i tartufi e viceversa, se non è, le uve quest'anno erano speciali, erano molto belle, ma purtroppo i tartufi sono molto pochi. Despite the good news about the wine, I'm not giving up on the truffles yet. Che? Brava, brava, e pepe, ferma, bianco, piccolo, mm. un gemello. Ma crescono anche in coppia? Eh sì. Eh, si sente già che è molto più profumato. <ride> <ride> Però purtroppo eh, quest'anno bisogna accontentarsi, eh. eh questo c'è, questo prendiamo. So even if a truffle hunter finds white truffles, they may not be the big ones that sell for the highest price. The harvest is unpredictable year to year. L'anno scorso in questa zona qui le due gemelle erano una di 80 grammi e l'altra di 100 grammi. Ah. Purtroppo quest'anno sono così. E quindi Abbiamo trovato questo bianco perché cosa c'è adesso intorno a noi? Vedete qui, siamo in una, in una zona così, c'è una, una, una rovere molto grande e là c'è un pioppo. Non si sa, può essere il pioppo o può essere la rovere. Uno dei due ha una radice che arriva fino a qua, che sarebbe quella che abbiamo visto prima, queste radici qua, queste micro radici, che portano al tartufo bianco. Difatti questa radice qua, This part of Piedmont is called Lange, which means hills in the local dialect. While poplar trees and dermas oaks are favorites for white truffles, their proximity to other trees also makes chestnut, linden, willow or hazelnut trees grow white truffles. It's like the whole forest is connected as one. But even still, not all trees make truffles. There is only one in a thousandth chance that the tree will actually enter in symbiosis with the truffle. The ones that do produce truffles produce dozens of varieties, of which only six are edible. Four black, a bianchetto, which means whitish, and the most prestigious, the white truffle. While black truffles grow year-round, the prized white truffle is seasonal and can only be collected in the four months. La profumazione del tartufo bianco d'alba arriva a una profumazione maggiore perché il terreno è molto compatto, un terreno molto marnoso, chiuso, quindi quando il tartufo arriva a maturazione ha un profumo che è diverso dagli altri, è più intenso. After truffles get dug up, the hole is closed with soil and leaves to hide the hunter's spot from competitors, the human ones. Dogs will find it, but a well-trained dog will know that the hole is empty even if it's covered. But the main reason why the soil is covered is so the root of the tree that made the truffle won't spoil. Il prossimo anno c'è il rischio che non abbiamo più produzione. Perché i punti sono sempre gli stessi? I punti sono sempre gli stessi, la zona è sempre la stessa, il giro che faccio io è sempre uguale. 
cambia l'orario, cioè io lo faccio per, per passione, perché se per me se fosse un lavoro non lo farei perché sarebbe troppo faticoso. Truffle hunters like Gianni usually sell their loot to local shops, which then clean and grade each truffle based on shape and weight. Normally a trifulao collects two or three white truffles per day. So the stray right here is the daily work of 15 to 20 people. The shop we visited, Tartufi Morra, was the very first company in the region to bring the humble local Alba white truffle to the global stage in the early 1900s. È un tartufo del genere, cioè come si fa appunto a distinguere se un tartufo è buono o insomma cattivo? Uh, questo qui ha dei buchi. Sì, ah, questo ha dei buchi, no? Uno pensa, ma che brutto ha dei buchi. No, assolutamente, se la lumaca ha la possibilità di mangiare, cosa mangia? Mangia quello più buono, giusto? Eh beh, certo. <ride> e allora, più che più della forma, conta sempre il profumo. Infatti uh -huh. io cosa faccio? Quando vedo uno così, la prima cosa che faccio a nuso è... Profumatissimo. Eh, non profuma, è un profumo molto delicato. Sì, perché poi dipende sotto quale pianta viene trovato, perché questo qua è un, è un salice. Il salice tiglio è più delicato, la quercia o la rovere è più intenso, però sono caratteristiche sì, sì. diverse. Quindi ogni tartufo ha una storia a sé, un profumo a sé, una cosa veramente... Eccezionale. Sì, incredibile. Once collected, a truffle has a very short shelf life, losing its aroma and flavor after a few days. This means that if you want to enjoy an Alba white truffle outside of the city of Alba, you'd have to ship it within 24 hours. Restaurants can pay from $4,000 to $10,000 a kilogram to fly these truffles across continents. The best way to preserve a truffle is to avoid washing it until the very last minute. Alessandro recommends soaking it in cold water for 15 minutes so dirt can come off easily. While black truffles have a harder skin and are cleaned with a stiff brush, white truffles need something a little bit more delicate that can gently remove dirt without scraping off the outer skin. Sto spazzolando uh, in una maniera più delicata di come mi spazzolo i capelli, insomma. <laughs> Perché proprio con terrore. Ah, vedi, vedi, qualcosa se ne sta andando. <laughs> una cosa particolare è può essere che subito dopo il lavaggio il profumo perda un po' di profumo, ma è normale. Cioè c'è un po', però molto meno pronunciato. Eh, però nel momento in cui tu aspetti 5 minuti che asciughi, poi il profumo ri riemerge. Ok, quindi non è stato spazzolato via. <ride> no, assolutamente no. At this stage, I know you're wondering the same things I am. What is the best way to eat it and what other foods does it pair with? We'll answer all these questions in the kitchen with chef Mirko Febrile, who traveled to Alba from Singapore to research white truffles for a new project. We joined him to taste white truffles at their fullest taste and strongest aroma. Hai visto come te l'ho pulito bene questo tartufo spazzolato proprio come Grande, se fosse un, uno stivale d'epoca. Quindi che, uh, adesso come, come lo andiamo a cucinare? Allora facciamo un primo, piatto di, un primo piatto degli spaghetti di un grano antico, Corasan, è un grano antico uh, coltivato in Puglia. Io sono pugliese. Io sono un pugliese. Uh, quindi utilizziamo tre degli ingredienti principali e uh, eccezionali del Piemonte, la fassona piemontese, la nostra nocciola delle langhe e poi il tartufo. E quindi come andranno questi, tutti questi sapori poi a complementare quello del tartufo? Allora, avremo la parte grassa della nocciola, la parte tostata della nocciola, che va a complementare anche la parte dell'umami del, del tartufo. E poi abbiamo la, la diversa consistenza con la pasta tra Uh, la, uh, la parte al dente della pasta e la parte tenera della carne, della fassona. Impiattiamo. Poi andiamo a condire la, la, la fassona, solo con un pizzico di sale e l'olio. Cosa ne pensi tu dell'olio al tartufo? Cioè perché non condire, se tu cerchi quella consistenza insomma dell'olio nel piatto, perché non utilizzare l'olio al tartufo? L'olio al tartufo è un sacrilegio, è praticamente la cosa più falsa che, che esista, è, è fatta sicuramente di, chimicamente. Quindi molto Però meglio l'olio d'oliva. Sì. Sempre. Senti il profumo. Wow che profumo. E i profumi sono ancora più forti adesso che l'hai... Esatto, perché comunque c'è la parte calda della pasta 
e quindi vai ad elevare quel, quei, quei sentori lì. Sì, come si vede che tu sei lo chef e io una persona <ride> che mangia? <ride> Si sentono un po' tutti. E avevo un esatto. po' paura che la nocciola sarebbe stata troppo forte perché l'odore era anche importante. Invece riesco anche comunque a sentire carne. Esatto. Quindi è molto importante il bilancio, mm -hmm. il fatto che c'è uh, abbastanza pepe bianco per... e poi senti il pizzichio del, dell'olio, sì, sì. però anche la, la, la burrosità di questa carne. Cosa trovi in questi tartufi che non trovi altrove? Quando, quando la stagione del tartufo inizia, in, a, e penso parlo per tutti i colleghi e in, insomma per tutto il mondo, per noi è festa. Il tartufo d'acqua tu aspetti, ed è sempre una, una cosa misteriosa, no? E poi è magico, perché ogni tartufo è diverso da, per sapori, per, sento, per, per sentori, per, per profumi, per, per consistenze anche. E, ma il fatto che tu devi aspettare un anno, quindi una stagione, che è l'autunno, è, è magico, è qualcosa di speciale. E devi venire qui per poterlo esatto. provare. In, in non nessun puoi... altro posto al mondo. Quella è la, la bellezza, quella è la cosa che lo rende speciale e unico. Woods and this woods only. Why? Ah. Why? 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 Tossing dough like this is the key to getting authentic Greek filo pastry incredibly thin. But this is only one of the challenges of making filo. Filo means leaf in Greek, and well, the name couldn't be more accurate. The thin layers are achieved by a very complex lamination that involves not only a fat like butter or margarine, but also oil. The oil gives extra slip and makes the pastry incredibly difficult to stretch. So difficult that most bakers have given up making filo by hand. We're in Thessaloniki and we're about to meet with Filippos Bantis. He's one of only a few artisans left still making filo by hand. This is his shop. Let's walk in. Filippos makes his filo using water, a soft semolina flour with strong gluten, salt, vegetable oil and margarine. It makes our filo more crunchy and light to the taste. To be strong enough to be tossed in the air, the dough needs to be mixed for 20 minutes and then be mixed again with more oil and margarine. So how is this dough different from like other types of dough that have like a lot of layers, like for example uh, croissant or um, yes, other uh, pastry? You cannot say that they have something in common, it's completely different. Okay. Because <laughs> we don't make layers of butter dough, butter dough. The layers are from the folding, yeah. but we make here. Yeah, you can smell a little bit the uh, oil and the margarine. After mixing, the dough rests for another 20 minutes on the counter. Here, Filippos is cutting it in small pieces of 250 grams each that will then be rolled into a bowl. Like a perfect, perfect bowl. We leave them to rest again for 20 minutes with our oil on it. It will make a crust over there if we don't put the oil, and we don't want that. After the 20 minute rest, Filippos uses his palms to press the dough, and not his fingers as they would create unwanted holes. Then, guess what? We have to wait another 20 minutes. It may sound like a lot of breaks, but this method is actually speeding things up. If the dough was kept as a whole, it would need much longer periods of rest. Now, okay. margarine inside. Ooh everywhere and yeah, this we put busy. them together <laughs> okay this uh, will help us make the lamination the layers mm -hmm. this will uh, separate the, the, the crust yeah the dough yeah, the dough we wait 20 minutes again and then the dough is ready to be tossed in the air can you Go a step back, thank okay. you very much. Despite its theatricality, this technique is not for show. It's used to evenly spread the fat in the dough and to avoid any lumps. And again, it's a faster and more effective way than any rolling pin could possibly be. So, should I give it a try? 
tossing out pillow in the air reminded me a bit of tossing pizza dough. It made me feel a little bit closer to home, although I have a feeling that it won't be very useful today. One hand like that, yep. okay, and the other hand like that, here. No, 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 take uh, it like, like that? that, yeah. Okay. Now, there and there. Oof, like that. Here. No, 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 no. <laughs> this side stays up. Okay, yeah. we will not. Ah, okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. Take that. The finger. The finger okay. here. So here. I see. So you don't want to flip it. It's no, just no, no, really no. to give it a little bit of. A little bit and that. There. Good. Very, very good. Ah. Bravo. Why is it that it doesn't break? It was all this preparation we make and the floor that, as I told you, it's strong. Yeah. It has a strong build. Wow, oh my God, look, yeah. you can see your yeah. hand. Ready now. If you can see your head, it's ready. Yeah, it feels very thin but strong. I don't really want to dare touching it more because I'm really scared. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to okay. break you it. You can try later. Yeah. yeah. So is, yeah. The, is the cold also why, why it stays yes, uh, yes. like that? We don't want the dough to be hot because it will break. Uh, and what's the most common mistake when you do this? These edges. You need a lot of practice and uh, experience to make them thin as in the center of the fold. Ev all the, this filo must be the same everywhere. This yeah. is the most, uh, yeah. the most difficult part. Of course, you must not have holes. Okay, that's, I think yeah. I touched there, sorry. It's a problem <laughs> that for many of us, the holes. If you don't take into account my awkward tossing technique, the right technique might still give you some holes. This can be because of the wrong preparation of the dough or the wrong temperature, especially in the summer months. In Greece, phyllo pastry is always paired with a pie, and often the making process changes depending on which pie it is. The one Filippos is making is specific to Bugazza, a popular breakfast pie in Thessaloniki and northern Greece. Bugazza filo is one of the most complicated to make because it has to be stretched and tossed in the air as a full large sheet, whereas other pies can be stretched in individual portions. Bugazza has been around for centuries, from the times of the Byzantine Empire. In fact, Filippos tells me that both his family and the pie came from modern-day Greece from Cappadocia, Turkey. My grandfather came as a refugee here in 1922 and brought all the recipes that we continue to make them. This is my father, uh, the year that opened this store in 1969. This is how they used to sell bugacha in the streets. Uh, this photo is in Constantinopolis, in Istanbul. The way you make filo um, is different depending on where you are in Greece. Ah, yes, you have uh, some difference. The most popular uh, breakfast is in North Greece, this bugacha. Here in Thessaloniki, we try to make more crunch, the filo. And in Ceres, the other town, it's, uh, they make the filo more uh, soft. Okay. It's a little yeah. different. The giant filo sheet is cut in the middle and covered with more oil and margarine. Filippos then fills it with a sweet cream that he and his team make in the shop. The cream is added at room temperature, otherwise it would break the filo. It's now time to fold the filo. Each folded side has four layers, so there are 16 in this half. The first folded half with the cream filling goes inside the unfolded half, which creates 32 layers in total for a bugatta. Yeah, the dough looks super like moist and humid. Mm. Like, uh, there is a little bit of uh, yeah, air. Yeah, we want the uh, air inside. Yeah? It will help us uh, to cook better inside the, bu the bugazza. Apart from sweet cream bugazza, you can also enjoy it as a savory pie with local cheese, spinach or meat. The people that make bugazza, year by the year, less and less and less and less, and this art will uh, disappear. And it's, it's a pity, it's another kind of food, the bugazza with the machines. So I want to show the young people that it's a beautiful job and it's a nice art. The pie rests in the fridge for 24 hours so all the flavors can come together and for maximum crunch. To achieve a golden crust, it cooks for 30 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius. One bugazza makes four portions. Traditionally, each portion is then cut in 10 small pieces. As the pie is traditionally eaten for breakfast, in Thessaloniki, bugazza with sweet cream is often enjoyed with a glass of chocolate milk. You can see the layers from here, over there, all these. Yes, they're over here. Yeah. 
Yeah, how many do we put? Uh, 32, you said. Yes, 32. 32. <laughs> It's a very simple, a very yeah. simple cream, but uh, the ingredients are all first quality, you know, and around Thessaloniki, local. Mm -hmm. Also, the crunch is not like an aggressive crunch. It's not oily, light. it's yeah. uh, light. Wow, it's yeah, very, it's very nice. It's very good.